right, we'll uh, open our Bibles tonight to Titus chapter 2, and we'll continue there uh, from where we left off last week. And last week, we started chapter 2 of Paul's letter to Titus, giving instructions to, for him to fulfill his ministry on the island of Crete. Um, we made it mostly through verse 5, but didn't quite finish it. We looked at Paul's instructions for how older men, uh, older women, and younger women, and younger men are to behave in life and in the church, and we talked about how the instructions for the older women and younger women are sort of blended together, and that's kind of where we ended last week. We didn't really finish verse 5, um, but I talked about the fact that those instructions for the older women and the younger women blend together, and what I mean by that is that there's a partial list for how older women are to behave, um, reverent, in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, verse 3. But that isn't all. Verse 4 describes the good they are to teach to the younger women. And the implication, as I mentioned last week, is that these are characteristics possessed by the older women as well. Uh, that's how they can teach them to the younger women, because they too are um, marked by these characteristics. And what were those things that Paul described as good, um, that those good things that the older women are to teach the younger women, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be self-controlled, be pure, be working at home, be kind, be submissive to their own husbands. And we talked about how most of these are pretty much accepted in our culture, but there's pushback on the ideas uh, of working at home and being submissive to husbands. And we should expect pushback from the world because this is not a uh, thing that is popular with the world. Um, but we should not expect pushback within the church. We should understand what is meant by this and, and recognize it for what it is. This is not about, uh, as I mentioned last week, it's not about female being lesser than male. The scripture is clear that we're both created in the image of God. Uh, that we are both sinners, that we are both in need of a Savior, and that we are both um, offered eternal life in Christ. And God is not subjugating one under the other. We are co-heirs with Christ. And Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, it's popular for this text to be used to say that there are no longer distinct roles for men and women in the church, but that's not true. We must look at the context of that passage in Galatians and see that it's about how God doesn't make distinctions in salvation. In, in other words, salvation is not limited to men or to Jews or to a certain class of people. All these people are saved the same way in Christ Jesus, and that's what that, that passage is dealing with. There are still God-given roles for men and women uh, within the family, within the church. And the wife is her husband's helper. <clears throat> and since when is someone who helps someone considered less than? Right, we don't consider that to be the case anywhere else. And God has given the wife to her husband as a helper. And, and, and the husband is wise to listen to and benefit from the help she gives. She is not a doormat. She's fulfilling her God-given role, uh, a role with dignity and purpose in the kingdom of God. It is not just something to be cast aside. And when uh, a younger woman is taught and learns from an older godly woman, she is prepared to be a godly wife and a mother and continue in the role that God has called her to, and the cycle goes on and on. That's how it's meant to be. And again, this is the general reality for men and women, not, it's, it's clearly not God's will for all men and women to be married, but these are the instructions for the general plan of God for the sexes. Otherwise, there would be no human race. Um, God has created it this way to function and to create more people. Uh, God's plan, God's purpose is in this is found in his word, and we, we do not make these things up on our own. It's not something that 
you know, men came up with. He has said, this is the way it's to be, and it is right. It is good and not to be despised or rejected. Okay, which brings us to where we left off last week. When, when Christian women reject the word of God and follow the anti-God cultural ideas for women, Paul ties this to the way people view God and what God has said. So let's look at and read this uh, sort of a larger passage here in, in Titus 2, starting verse 3, we'll go through verse 10, and then we'll pray for our study tonight. So Titus 2, verse 3, older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young, young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. So let's open in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for tonight, for the gathering of, of people here to uh, read your word, to um, learn from your word. We pray, Lord, you would help us to have understanding, help us to have right thinking, and uh, Lord, that our thoughts and our actions would be guided by your word, and that we would delight in doing your will. So we ask God for you to continually sanctify us in your word, and we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name, amen. So Paul indicates that there is somewhat of a spotlight on God and on his word here. Right, this is, there is a connection between Christian women being obedient to the word of God here and how the word of God is viewed uh, in the world or by the world. In other words, there is an even greater purpose in obedience to these commands than things going well in the household. It's, it goes beyond that. Now, the reputation of God is on the line. And Paul says, Christian wives are be, to be submissive to their own husbands. And then he gives the reason, that the word of God may not be reviled. Okay, so if they're not doing the things on this list, including submitting to their husbands, the word of God is reviled. And some translations say the word is slandered. Okay, it has shame brought upon it. People will malign the word of God. Dis, dishonor, it's dishonored, it's discredited, it's blasphemed. And here, Christian women would profess godliness but live against what he says, so the world is left to judge the word of God as illegitimate, as stupid, uh, and perhaps, worst of all, it's unable to transform lives. And this is about a testimony to the world that Christians are redeemed, Christians are transformed, separated, or they are separated from the world, separated to God and his purposes. To not live in obedience here is to cause others to blaspheme the word of God when we're supposed to be doing the opposite with our lives. And Matthew 5, 16 says, In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This is the pattern for living for Christians. That's what we should be doing is being obedient. And as we're obedient, it points to Christ. And sadly, we often fail at this because uh, we don't want to be obedient for different reasons. And one of them sometimes is that we live in a world that mocks Christianity, a world that mocks the Word of God. God is concerned for the holiness of His name. And when we are disobedient to His Word, the world is left to despise God. Um, it gives credibility to what they already think about God. And when God judged Israel for their idolatry, as described by the prophet Ezekiel, God scattered his people around among other nations, and those nations noticed. And they noticed what, what God was doing with his people. And Ezekiel 36, 20 and 21 says, 
But when they came to the nations, wherever they came, they profaned my holy name, in that people said of them, these are the people of the Lord, and yet they had to go out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations to which they came. See, the name of God was profaned among the nations because they were not living in a way that showed God deserved to be feared or obeyed. Our lives are a testimony to the power of God to redeem and transform people's lives and that his name is worthy of praise and he is worthy to be obeyed. So what Paul is writing about here um, as the purpose for godly wives being submissive to their own husbands is for the sake of God's holy name. That what he says is not to be reviled, but obeyed because it is right and is true. So let's move on now to the next verse and the instructions for younger men. Okay? I briefly touched on it last week. I think we noticed that there was a list of, what, 11 things for women and one thing for younger men. And that's not, again, that's not because younger men have everything figured out, okay? Um, so verse 6, likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Okay, one thing on the list, they are to be self-controlled. And some translations here have sober-minded or sensible uh, or even to live wisely. And the idea here is not that the young man have all other areas if, of instruction for older men and, and um, older women, they have all these things figured out and they do them, they obey them perfectly. That's not what's being said here. And this command really encompasses everything. Uh, the young, if the young men live self-controlled or sensible lives, they will be obedient to all the commands of Scripture. Now, they're not free from the commands that were given to the older men, but they need to be self-controlled as they are taught and follow the examples of the older men. They're not free from those commands, so don't read something into the fact that there was only one thing on there. Uh, they are just as responsible for the commands of, of living godly lives as, uh, as the older men would be. Um, which, you know, the fact that as they grow and mature in the Lord and, and knowing his word, watching the example of the older men, um, that leads to why Paul gives his next instruction. And he gives it to, to Titus himself. It's more of a personal note here for Titus, kind of mixed in with this list of instructions for other people. And he says, Paul says to Titus that he's to be an example for others to follow. If we look at, at Titus 2, 7, and 8, here he says, Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. He says, be a model of good works. He says, or be an example, some other translations say. And the word Paul used there is tupas, which is referring to really to a mark or impression left by some sort of tool, um, some sort of object. Um, you know, for example, when a, when a criminal breaks into a building, an investigator comes and determines a point of entry by damage, whether it's to a, a wooden frame of a window or a door jam, something like that. Um, and, and by looking more closely or examining the scene more thoroughly, other facts can be determined as well. And so then that brings up a question. How does the investigator determine what tool the criminal used to get in? What do you guys think about that? How does he determine what tool was used? You think about all the, you know, crime shows you've ever watched. What do they look at? How do they figure out what tool they used? Okay, the damage that, that was done, sure. And they can look more closely at that damage, and they can look at see what the impression is. You can tell if there was a screwdriver used, or if there was a crowbar used, they leave a, a very distinct mark uh, in the wood. It, it, it impresses that into the wood, and you can tell what kind of tool that is. If you have any knowledge about what tools look like, you can figure that out. And in the same way, the cops can determine this criminal's activity is marked by the 
striking with a, or the prying with a crowbar, the Christian can be determined to be a follower of God by the impression he or she leaves as well. It is the impression of the word of God. Is that what it's going to be for the Christian, or is it the impression of the desires of a sinful heart? In other words, Paul is telling Titus here, your life is not just about the words you say to people about God. It is supposed to make a mark or leave an impression by your own obedience to God. It makes an impression. Others can see it lived out and praise the name of the Lord as they follow the same pattern. And Titus is told to do this, Paul says, in all respects. Okay, in every area of life, he is to be a model of good works. That sounds like a lot of pressure. Uh, but that's really what all of us should be doing as Christians. Our lives should be marked by good works. Um, so what are good works? How do we know what good works are as Christians? Where do we find those? In the Word of God, in the Bible. What, what are some of the good works that God has prepared for us to do? You know, we can see even in this list of things here and, and what he tells, how he tells the men to behave, when they do that, those are good works. When the women behave as God has instructed them to behave, those are good works. When we love one another, when we love our brothers and sisters in Christ, um, those, are, those are good works. And God has commanded us to do those things. All that, that we are commanded to do in the scriptures in obedience to God, those would be good works if we did them. And Paul says his, about Titus that his teaching or doctrine is to be marked by integrity, dignity, and sound speech. And again, it's for a purpose, uh, it, it, which is so that what he says cannot be condemned by others, causing the name of the Lord to be reviled. Again, see, it comes back to the viewpoint that, is, uh, that the world has of God, or even other Christians, Right, it's the same, same thing. We want to be, um, he's being told to speak a certain way so that he cannot be condemned by others. When Paul writes about Titus having sound speech, he's really talking about the things he says day to day. It's not just about any time you're teaching, though it would be about that, but it's about all of his interactions with people from day to day. Uh, it would include the way that he talks when he's teaching, of course, um, but in regular conversation uh, as well. He's to be known for speaking in such a way as to edify, to build up, to show kindness, compassion, patience, etc. All the other ways that we're to treat other people, um, this would be sound speech. The marks of someone who is a follower of Christ, someone sanctified by the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Um, what's the opposite of that? The opposite of that is someone with harsh words, um, condemning words, um, judgmental words, uh, unrighteously judgmental words, and uh, words that tear people down, words that aren't fitting for a Christian, coarse joking, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, that would not be the mark of sound speech that he's talking about here, and he wants him to be marked by sound speech. And, and so by doing that, then he's not open to accusations. He's not open. People can make accusations, but he wouldn't be open to accusations that are actually true uh, because they wouldn't be true. The person making a false accusation against him will be the one put to shame, not Titus. And that's what Paul is saying here. Um, and remember the types of people on the island of Crete that Paul warned about earlier when we were in chapter 1, um, verses 10 and 11. He says, for there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. And he says, they must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. Well, in addition to sound doctrine, this is one of the ways that these opponents are silenced, right, by a life that matches the doctrine espoused. And we say we're Christians, and, and we say we love God, and we love His Word, 
and then we go out and live an opposite example of that, uh, that doesn't make sense. Um, that wouldn't be, that would be hypocritical. It wouldn't be true. It would bring, um, you know, disrepute on God. Um, and so he says these opponents, they'll, they'll have nothing evil to say. And even if they did, it wouldn't be believed because of the reputation, because of the example or impression made by Titus's hearers. And this is true of all of us. Uh, we want to have a reputation that is in accordance with the word of God, that points people to Christ, points people to the fact that we have a life that has been changed and transformed by the Holy Spirit. So then what are, as we talk about those things, think about those things, what are the benefits then of living lives of obedience to Christ by word and deed for men and women who've been redeemed? What are the benefits of living those kinds of lives for us? What do you guys think? Peace? Okay, have peace. Okay. What else? What other benefits? Okay. So you're pointing others to Christ by a life of obedience. Absolutely. And we think about the other things that he said here, that the name of the Lord will not be blasphemed if we live lives of obedience. Uh, the word of the Lord will not be despised. Others will see our lives and glorify God. That's back to the, the Matthew 5 passage that we read. Opponents will be put to shame. All right, now we're not going around wagging our fingers and making fun of people who would be put to shame. That's not the point. Um, you know, the point ultimately and always is that when someone would be, would be put to shame, it's not for the sake, just for the sake of being put to shame, but that they would turn and come to faith in Christ by what they've seen in the lives of the believers around them. It's like the charge that Paul gave to Timothy after he gave Timothy specific instructions about not only about how he's to live, but how people are to behave in the, in the church, in the household of God. Um, he says in 1 Timothy 4, 15 and 16, to Timothy, he says, practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Right, so these are not just weekend behaviors. Right, sometimes we're, our lives are lived like we come to church on Sunday, and then we go out and we have our other life, and then we come to church on Sunday, and we behave a certain way on the weekend. These are not just weekend behaviors. They're lifelong pursuits for the Christian uh, with the goal that others will be watching. And if you've been a Christian for long, if you've let others know you're a Christian, you know they are watching. Right? They'll may, they may even make comments if you say a certain thing you know, that they disagree with, but it's something that in the truth of God's word, they'll, they'll make comments. They're watching. They're listening. They're also watching for when you, when you mess up. right? And then you know, they want to be able to say you're a hypocrite. And, and despise the word of God. But these are lifelong pursuits for us. He says, persist in this way of living. These are things God uses. He uses these in our lives to draw unbelievers to himself and to encourage believers to continue steadfast in the faith. And there's, here in this passage, there's one final group of people that Paul gives instructions to. To Titus 4, and I think it really rounds off the whole list of people that we've already looked at. Okay, with this last group, we can see that everyone is covered. In fact, many in this last group are also members of the other groups. There are older men and women, and younger men and women in this final group. And look at verses 9 and 10 with me. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of, our, of God our Savior. And so we need to talk about what a bond servant is to have context for these two verses. And we see this word, doulos, translated in our Bibles either as bond servants or, or bond slaves 
or servants or slaves, depending on your translation. And this word is referring to a person who is totally under the control of and at the disposal of their master. Um, it is what it sounds like. Right? The, he is subservient to the master and will act unquestioningly to his commands. And this was the case most of the time. But the word also referred to those who would sometimes, who would voluntarily submit themselves to a life of service to others. Okay, but, but for the most part, um, it was what we think of here. And during the time that this was written, slavery was very common um, in the Roman Empire. Um, the Romans relied heavily on um, slaves, um, and they relied heavily on the possession of and the work of slaves. Um, and of course, this was not invented by the Romans. Right? It's not like slavery just appeared uh, in the first century. It has been a thing forever. You go all the way back to Genesis, and we can see reference to slaves, people who are slaves of others. Slaves were often uh, mistreated and could have um, the worst of things done to them without any repercussions to their masters. Their masters could do whatever they wanted with them. They would not face any, um, you know, criminal prosecution or anything like that. Um, and then there were times some were treated quite well because of their ability to wisely handle their master's property and bring about growth or to um, do for the master what no one else could do. So not all masters were evil, um, but certainly um, most of them probably were. And we can see this sort of difference in a couple of Old Testament figures in, in terms of slaves who um, profited or their masters profited by them uh, or that they were living a life as slaves but were given a lot of authority and power themselves. Um, we see this in Joseph's life uh, as a slave in Genesis 39, 2 through 4. It says, the Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his Egyptian master. Remember, he was sold into slavery by his brothers. Okay, his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. And he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. Okay, yeah. I think we'll get to that in a minute, and I think it'll answer your question, but if it doesn't, then ask me again. Um, we can see it in Daniel's life as a slave, right? Um, Daniel 2, 48. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. What did Daniel do to get that? Yeah, he interpreted his dream for him, right? So here he is, a slave, and now he's elevated up to this place, uh, being, being over all the wise men of Babylon. Okay, but nevertheless, uh, most of slavery has always been fraught with abuse and harshness toward slaves. And this was no different at the time that Paul wrote this to Titus um, and, and where he was living on the island of Crete, um, and he's being instructed by Paul here regarding the behavior of bondservants, the behavior of the slaves. And it's important for us to know that the Bible nowhere condones the bad treatment of slaves. It, it regulates slavery, actually, giving instructions for the behavior of masters and slaves we can see that, both of that in the scriptures. The Bible does not, um, the Bible does condemn the practice of what is sometimes known as man-stealing, okay? And I think it gets to what you're asking about. For example, in Exodus 21, 16, uh, it says, whoever steals a man and sells him and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. 
And Deuteronomy 24, 7, if a man is found stealing one of his brothers of the people of Israel, and if he treats him as a slave or sells him, then that thief shall die. You shall purge the evil from your midst. And see, the scriptures are calling this evil, this so human trafficking, um, you know, the slavery that we knew here in the United States, all these kinds of things where um, people are stolen and taken and sold for profit and for labor, those kinds of things are condemned by Scripture. And in fact, with the harshest of condemnations, it was punishable by death, the person found doing this. And in Bible times, people were, they were enslaved for many different reasons. And sometimes including because it was a way of providing for their families. Sometimes they would enslave themselves to others because it provided some level of security and provision for their family that was more consistent. Um, or um, sometimes because they actually loved their masters. Their masters were so kind to them and they provided for their families. They wanted to stay and serve them the rest of their lives. Again, none of this is an excuse for mistreatment of people who are slaves to their masters or for taking one against their will to sell them into slavery. And also, it's not just the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament, we see in a list of people described as lawless, disobedient, profane, and ungodly, we see in that list those who are the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, okay, and that's the same thing we're talking about, those who would steal people, um, sell them um, for profit, um, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. So to do those things, back to the subject of slavery, to do those things of stealing people and selling people and all that is contrary to sound doctrine. It's contrary to the word of God. Yeah, whenever and wherever that took place, that is sinful. So because the scriptures mention it and say that it happens is not a, a condoning of that behavior, right? The scriptures, they document all kinds of times where people were taken and sold. And we talked about Joseph. Not always. Go ahead, Rosie. It is different. I mean, you laugh because it's, it's sort of the same, but it is different in a way. And in fact, God himself used pagan nations to um, over, overcome his people and take them into slavery because of their idolatry. So God permitted that. It, it's sinful for people to do that. He still help, holds those nations that do it accountable. Uh, it's, it's one of those mysteries uh, that God uses the sinful acts of another nation to do that and to punish his own people, but he's also holding responsible that nation that does what they did in taking them. So um, it's not, there's never a place in the scripture where just because it mentions it doesn't mean that God is condoning the evilness of that kind of slavery. Well, right, so today in our modern sense, um, you're gonna, we do have things like human trafficking. That is, that's, th that's criminal activity that is when discovered and found out, they are removed from that situation and those doing it are held accountable. Um, and so I, it's, if there was a Christian who was taken captive, it doesn't, that doesn't absolve them from being obedient to God, but it also doesn't mean they have to stay in that place when and if they can get away or if they're rescued or something like that. And it doesn't mean that the person doing that will, will be unaccountable for that, whether by our criminal authorities 
our earthly authorities or ultimately by God. Um, they will be held accountable for that. So it's sort of different in a sense that they're, um, than what we're talking about here in, in biblical times, but um, you know, in a way, if you're a Christian and you're taken captive, whether it's in that industry or you know, some other industry, we're still accountable to God for our behavior and our treatment of others. Oh yeah, yeah, it's been going on for a long time. It is not new. Uh, in some ways, in our country, it's made easier by technology and those kinds of things. Um, That's why I say, as Christians, our, our way of living is and should be different. We should be living in a mindset of obedience to God. And so that, even in the, ca even in the uh, custody of our enemies, we are to be Christians and living as Christians. Um, and so, you know, that's all you can really say about it is, because what's the flip side? The flip side is to not behave as a Christian. Um, and I don't know what that would look like in that particular instance, but certainly Christians are always to be Christians and are not given permission to not behave like Christians, no matter what their circumstances. And we have to remember that in the context of when Paul's writing this in, and in the early church, there was great persecution of Christians. And Peter writes about it and how we're to behave as Christians, even in the face of the worst of abuses and, and earthly masters. We're still commanded to be, behave as Christians, to be obedient to God. <laughs> well, you, you, know, I, you know, that touches on another subject too. I mean, I do believe as Christians we have the right to defend ourselves if someone is attacking us, um, you know, but... Again, I think it's going to depend sort of on a situation there, um, but we're we're to be we're called to be followers of Christ, no matter what our circumstances are and what situation we're in, um, and whatever that looks like in that situation. I don't know. I, none of this is to say that that's easy or they need to just get over it. Um, and and again, none of this is to say that that behavior is right. But that is the behavior of sinful men. It is we are all in this world where we are confronted by sinful behavior all the time. And some, uh, some of us go through worse things than others, and that, that some of them that we can't even imagine having to go through. Um, but you can hear testimonies of people who have gone through things like that, whereas they, they, in the midst of all that, treated someone as a Christian should treat them. And there's testimonies of people who have come to faith in Christ you know, violent people who have come to faith in Christ because the people they were being violent against, because of the way they reacted and the way they lived, it, it did everything to point them to Christ. So, again, it's hard to have this conversation and talk about this without it ever sounding like there's an excuse for that kind of behavior. There is not at all. And the scripture makes it clear that that is absolutely sinful behavior. Yes. I'm not sure I understand your question. Right? Right. Well, it wouldn't be an endorsement of it. it it's this is see the thing is we have these conversations, and, the, and he goes into the scriptures and dealing with this, and he's, what he's not doing is 
dealing with the subject of slavery, really. He's dealing with the behavior of those who are enslaved. There's, he's commanding a certain behavior from those who are enslaved. He's not even really touching the issue here in our passage about the circumstances in which they were enslaved or who's enslaving them. This is instructions about Christians and how they're to behave. So it's not an endorsement of criminal behavior or of um, slavery. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's, if, if you're kidnapped and someone's driving you away in a car and you get an opportunity to get out and run away, there's nothing here that says you can't do that. Yeah, so the question, the question is what, you know, that we were trying to answer about the trafficking and all that is not the context of this passage. Right. right. No, that is, that is clear and that is true. Um, so yeah, we, can, we can talk about that question, but that's not the setting that Paul is talking about here.
Yeah, this is, it's difficult. It's difficult to think about, you know, the lives of Christians and even not even in, in terms of slavery, but just the harshness of the world and the way that, that persecution comes about uh, among believers, um, that we are, we are still called to, to be obedient to Christ, to, um, to love our enemies. And this is contrary to what the world would say. All of this, the behavior that's being called on here for Christians to live by, um, is contrary to what the world would say. So it's always going to rub us a little bit the wrong way if we're trying to look at it through a worldly lens, for sure. Uh, but even looking at it through a scriptural lens, uh, it's, it's a difficult concept because we have this sort of pull towards fairness and all that kind of stuff um, when really we're, we're called by God to, to take up our cross daily and follow him. We're, we're called to die to self and... Um, like you say, if, if, if being a Christian means I'm killed for my faith, which we don't really experience here in our country, but across the world is still happening all the time, um, to become a Christian is a death sentence. Um, and so it's difficult. The life of a Christian is, is difficult, for sure. Um, so these are hard things to think about. But we do need to understand when we're talking about slavery and in biblical terms, all those, those kinds of things. There are different circumstances. Um, it meant different things, and so we kind of have to understand what's going on. We can't just look at it through the lens of what we know as slavery, which is our, our nation's history of slavery. Um, not everything is that, and that, that is, uh, everybody would agree, pure evil, um, and the scriptures don't condone that. They, uh, in fact, speak against it. So, uh, But we do have to understand things you know, as we're reading them here in, in this context. Um, and we can't help but notice when we go through, we read passages like this, and we look at the Bible, we can't help but notice that the Bible isn't constantly scolding masters for having slaves. It's just not going after masters all the time. Um, what do we see instead? We see God telling his people how to behave if, if they're slaves. Um, and we do see instruction for masters and how they're to behave as well, but mostly for how the slaves are to behave. And Paul covered this, I think he covered this thoroughly in Ephesians when he wrote uh, to the Ephesians uh, and instructed Christian slaves how to behave and talked about their, their masters in uh, Ephesians 6. I actually want to turn there, if you'll turn there with me, and we can look at what it says there. Ephesians 6, verses 5 through 9. It says, Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord, and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. And you, so you see this is not a call even to change your circumstances, but how and why you should obey God as you are or where you are. Um, nowhere in that did Paul address the subject of slavery as being good or bad, um, but he tells the Christians how to be good slaves as Christians. And there's uh, a reason the slaves, the slave is with that master. And people like to say things like, you know, Jesus came to start a revolution. Well, that's not true. He didn't come to start a revolution or to reshape society or to solve poverty or any such thing. Why did Jesus come? Salvation, right? He came to save sinners. Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Right? To save sinners from hell. To redeem the spiritually lost and dead and give them eternal life. That's why Jesus came. 
And if Jesus came, honestly, if Jesus came to start a revolution or end poverty, he's really bad at it, right? Because it's totally unsuccessful. There's still poverty. There's still sin. Um, things are just getting worse and worse all the time, as the scriptures say they will. So we, want, we mustn't lose sight of why he came and, and why we're left here um, in this unrevolutionized place. Now, we're here to point people to Christ through the proclamation of the gospel and by the evidence of a changed life. Um, and that includes those who are slaves at that time and in our time. And, and so Titus is to, according to Paul, Titus is to remind bondservants to be submissive to their own masters and everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. He doesn't tell them, again, in, in the context we're talking about here, he doesn't tell them to run away or to fight the power or to start a revolution. He says, be submissive to your masters and everything. Does he say, unless your master is mean or harsh? No, he doesn't, he doesn't qualify that. He just says to be submissive. No, he doesn't say to, that you have an out if your master is mean. Uh, and this is not a commentary on masters, but on the response of the bondservant. Yeah. Yeah, it's not just that it could be a good witness, witness. It is. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. And and really, what was that? Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and and really this is the in our context, this is the closest thing we have to what he's writing about and that is we have bosses. We have earthly bosses, masters that we work for, um, you know. And so, having that in mind, um, this this command carries forward for us. This is this doesn't change that. This is how we're to be to our earthly masters, to our bosses, the people that we work for, that we're that we're underneath. Um, God commands here. He's commanding the people in Paul's day to do this. This carries forward for us as well in our context. So when he says submit in everything to your earthly masters, that's what we are to do. And we are to be well-pleasing, he says. Our work should be excellent. Our work should be such that it does point to Christ. That we're, they can't help but compare our work to other people and say, wow, this person, everything they do is excellent. They take pride in what they do. They do a good job. Um, and they also know, or they should know, that we are a believer. Um, we shouldn't be argumentative, not talking back to them or contradicting them, not pilfering. We don't really use that word a whole lot anymore, but, you know, it's talking about setting aside things that belong to the master for yourself. It's stealing, right? We don't, we're not to do that. Um, showing all good faith, he says. And this is about loyalty and, and trustworthiness and dependability. And th those things should mark the lives of Christians as they go to work, as they work for their earthly masters. If someone is to ask that boss, what is this employee like? These should be some of the things. Boy, they are, they are trustworthy. They're dependable. They, they work hard. Their work is done very well, um, you know, and all those things. And they may not be thinking about it in terms of it's because they're a Christian, 
And that certainly doesn't mean that there are no non-Christians who do excellent work, right? But we want to, as Christians, be pointing a spotlight on Christ. We don't want to give an occasion where we could be accused of not living the way that we profess to live. Again, there's a purpose in all this obedience. Um, Just like how the older men and women and younger men and women are to behave, Paul says the bondservant is to behave this way at the end of verse 10, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. And you see, the end um, is still the same. The word of God is not being despised. Slaves are to do their work in this way because it adorns the word of God. And the idea there is that what you do or say accentuates or shines a light on what is already so beautiful. Uh, not covering it up or, or detracting from it um, by disobedience. We are to, to dress up the word of God by our obedience. And we cannot, we cannot make God attractive to people by how many, if you're talking about the church, by how many programs we have or by the sophistication of our technology. We make God attractive by living the life of obedience to his word, no matter what our circumstances. And it's hard, right? It, it's, the, it's the holiness, it's the submissiveness of God's people to what he says that points directly to Jesus and his glory and not our own. And that's that's what he's getting at here. That's the, the point. The point is not that someone's a slave. The point is, how are they doing as a slave? How are they living the Christ-like life as a slave? And when, when the bond slave submits themselves to their master, what are they ultimately doing? Right, submitting to God himself, and it does show glory to God. Right, They are... The, this submission to earthly masters is really a submission to our heavenly master um, because he has saved us from sin um, and, and this kind of obedience leads to uh, eternal life. You know, Romans 6.22 says, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. And that's the point. That's why Christ came. And, and there's a reason we're left here, and it's not because of a revolution. Um, you know, he does use us as, as tools to spread the gospel and to point people to him, but ultimately, Christ came to transform lives, to save lost sinners. So Titus has an important task ahead. He's, he's not only to live an example to the people every day through his life, but also to call them to do the same and to live according to every word of God. And again, just like we're having this discussion tonight, you can imagine in their context as he's going to come with this word about how they're to be submissive bond servants, and they might be thinking, what do you mean? I, you know, my master is harsh, terrible. Yet, this is the call of the Christian. So, um, they are, he's got to take this, this is his task to, to go and teach this and to live it out. Um, we're to go against our fleshly desires, and despite the mocking of, of opponents, God will pay you back for your obedience. He will reward us for our obedience. So next time, we'll wrap up this chapter by looking at, um, I think, the overall reason why we can and should live this life that Paul is instructing Titus to live. And, you know, just as a hint, it has everything to do with the grace of God in salvation and for his glory. And that's why we should, um, we should live this life of obedience. Um, it's out of our sincere thankfulness to God for his salvation in Christ because um, he has dealt bountifully with us. So let's close in prayer tonight. Father in heaven, we thank you for tonight. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Uh, Father, it is difficult to be a Christian and we think about these first century Christians that uh, Titus was having to minister to and to bring this word to, Lord, and the difficulty they had. Um, yet, Lord, your command is, is clear that they were to live a life of obedience to you. They were not to be like worldly men and women would be, but like 
those who have been transformed by Christ would be. Help us, Lord, in our context, help us in our daily lives to be submissive to our, our masters, Lord, to be uh, examples for Christ, to not be stealing, um, Lord, to not be speaking against our bosses, to, um, to be faithful employees, Lord, loyal and trustworthy and dependable, not so that we can receive praise, Lord, but so ultimately you can receive praise and glory. And may that be our response when people ask, why do you behave this way? Why do you do everything with excellence? And may it be because you have dealt with us so bountifully in forgiving our sins, saving us, uh, giving us eternal life. And may, may it be out of a, a joyful response of obedience that we want to live a life pleasing to you, Lord. Not so that we can gain favor with you or anything like that, uh, for we know that we cannot do that by our works, Lord. But we thank you for the righteousness of Christ um, that allows us to be justified in your sight. We'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.